There we are. Good morning. So uh, I won't be able to see you while I'm talking. I need to be able to read what's in front of me. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. This is my first meeting in a couple of years. So, um, And I will just say I haven't broken some of my bad habits from previous talks. So uh, I'll try not to be long-winded today. Um, bringing you just an update on a workshop called uh, FAIR for Us, so FAIR in the US. Uh, we wanted to gather community input um, around uh, the implementation of FAIR and current uh, successes and roadblocks and what we might want to do to set a, a plan. Um, so uh, we all know that we're uh, in various stages of implementation of the FAIR data principles um, and their inspirational and aspirational aims for funders and research managers. But there's a particular aim that we're all looking for, and that's to improve the reuse of data for new scientific discovery and scholarship. Uh, and there's a whole range of, of uh, activities we can do and opportunities to expand expert data workforce in support of institutional work on public access to federally funded research, to drive AI initiatives and foster markets for new technologies and implementation services, and to develop new practices and tools and services uh, to create and improve the fairness of data and related research objects uh, that will improve the machine readability and interoperability to facilitate decision making about the reuse of data, whether uh, that's for various or particular purposes and of course across sectors. So um, we were funded by NSF to do this workshop um, and the plan originally was that this would happen in advance uh, of, um, of the solicitation for fair and open science and RCNs, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but what we did was put together uh, a workshop that would allow us to think about um, identifying f first steps or next steps and planning activities for research data code workflows. So even though we all talk about the FAIR data principles, um, it's really clear from our work, uh, both across the, the FAIR uh, data stewardship community, uh, but also amongst our domain science colleagues, that uh, at this point, we really do need to be thinking about and focusing some energy on what does FAIR mean for code and scientific software and workflows and the other kinds of objects we really need to be able to have access to, uh, not only for reproducibility, that is one slice of what we're thinking about, but really to capture the scholarly record and to facilitate reuse over time. Um, secondary benefit of this workshop uh, was an opportunity for conversations among people that don't normally sit in meetings together. So, you know, one of the things I think, uh, at least in some communities, research data management community in particular, I think we uh, have over the last five years or so had a lot of the same conversations. It's great, we have really figured out some things we need to do and ways we need to engage our organizations and the researchers. Uh, but we also need to start to build a plan to move forward uh, beyond some of those things that we know already and, and are doing already. Um, so we aimed for a diverse stakeholder uh, and, and funding organization representation uh, to explore opportunities for multi-agency kinds of, of efforts. Um, and we also wanted to think about novel approaches uh, for really thinking about U.S. competitiveness uh, in, the, in research and development. So I'm happy to talk about any of these points on my slides. I'm going to try not to read all of them. Uh, uh, so time for q and I'm happy to go back and think about any of these. So as I mentioned, um, we, we did think, uh, well, we weren't sure when the solicitation was going to drop from NSF. And so one of the goals was to help the broader community start to think about uh, what would a research coordination network approach uh, be like for building capacity uh, and, and uh, standards around FAIR. Um, the FAIR and Open Science Research Collaboration Network Program seeks to create three-year RCNs that will support a broad range of activities to advance uh, the ways that investigators can share information, ideas, coordinate research activities, foster synthesis and new collaborations, and develop community standards 
all of that to advance science. So really, this new solicitation is a way for NSF to begin to think about how to engage the community more broadly uh, around some of these problems related to data, software, uh, and open science, uh, implementation of, of FAIR or verification of, of materials in order to drive science forward. So I won't spend any time at all talking about FAIR. We can do that again if people have questions when we get to Q&A. Um, but this slide is still important, I think, for organizing sometimes conversations that we have uh, because it is a set of principles. It is aspirational. It's not an end goal. The FAIR principles uh, are aims and, and for all kinds of science and scholarship uh, and research data services uh, uh, and related projects, products, um, really they sit along a continuum, right? So we don't reach an end result and just check a box. It's really about uh, the progress toward, toward FAIR. So a little bit of the novelty here and in innovation in our planning um, was that uh, we've taken some lessons from the last couple of years in Zoom meetings and conferences. Uh, all of us, I think, have, have spent time sitting through full days of meetings. This is very difficult. Uh, we lose our, our, our innovation and brain power after a couple of hours, and so we said, okay, we know we need to be virtual. We'll have multiple sessions across a, a few days. We'll leave some thinking time in between. Um, our sessions were averaged about two hours. Um, we had plenary time and then discussion time. That discussion time was facilitated, and that was uh, fundamentally important, uh, really to keep us focused on a set of questions we wanted to answer. Um, we used a set of modalities uh, to gather input, um, not only presentations uh, and discussion and Q&A from the plenary sessions, but we used Jamboard to really facilitate um, uh, brainstorming and some theme building uh, and work toward some operational aims. Uh, and then we use Menti polls to, to vote and rank some of those things to move towards some community consensus. One of the most important things, we had an advisory committee, uh, and they were brilliant at reining me in, uh, getting, beyond my, getting beyond scope of what we were trying to do, and also in the kinds of ways we wanted to engage the, the community um, around these questions we were, we were asking. Um, the meeting was invitational, and we did that because uh, we wanted to make sure we had experts in the room from a wide variety of stakeholder groups uh, and also across domains uh, and organization types. And one of the things that we did was make sure we had money built into the grant to pay the people that were working. So, you know, there's, there are a lot of hidden costs, as we all know, to all this work we do around stewardship and curation. Uh, and we felt it was really important, uh, while, while we weren't able to pay people salary levels, of course, providing honoraria for uh, participation in the delivery of the workshop uh, was, was quite important. Okay. So what did we do in process? Um, we set the stage. We organized what we were going to do at the start of each meeting. Uh, we considered a range of existing models uh, and initiatives across all four of the sessions. We spent time discussing and identifying and prioritizing the aims or actions that we might take based on some of those things we heard uh, and, the, and the organizing questions for that session. And we'll be developing a scoping report. So we're doing analysis now, and some of the outputs uh, that we're going to talk about in a minute, some of the uh, initial uh, outcomes or ideas uh, are just initial. We're just starting the analysis now. But one of the things we want to do is think about, um, and the way we sort of framed all of this was, what's achievable in the next five years? Um, and how do we also consider what's happening in the EU uh, and the UK that might be most successful here in the US context? How might we adapt or adopt some of those things? So here are the sessions uh, that we ran. And part of the reason we spent time thinking about international initiatives is, uh, quite frankly, in terms of fair funding, or funding around fair initiatives. There's been a lot of funding in the EU. There's a lot of activity. There are nonprofit organizations. There are new kinds of initiatives and novel efforts at institutions. Uh, and uh, NSF was really quite interested in hearing about uh, where there's leadership there and how we might engage and collaborate, but also bring some of those things, uh, successes here uh, to the states. Um, the other thing we wanted to do in terms of domain sciences 
and think about, uh, hear from them on successes for community initiatives was really to understand um, and have some conversation across groups that don't normally sit in the same meetings. Uh, and so we had very different kinds of people representing, uh, you know, from different kinds of projects and organizations representing very different kinds of science. Uh, we met in advance with almost all of the plenary speakers uh, and, and panelists, um, the domain group we did as a panel, uh, in order to provide context for the whole of the workshop and also to suggest particular shaping for their talks based on their expertise. Um, this was uh, really important to being able to get the aims met that we needed and to stimulate the conversations for discussion. So some uh, notable uh, points out of the plenaries. Um, now. Some of this is not breaking new ground. You've heard about a lot of these individual points in various meetings and reports, um, but starting to put this into a coherent space to be able to think about um, uh, setting a pathway forward and some aims that might be achievable at different levels of fa the, the FAIR implementation process uh, is really important. So um, on metadata, you know, so that one of the most important, uh, we had a couple of people talk about biomedical sciences and uh, fundamental problem in that space where we'll need not only the biomedical science experts, uh, but we'll also need people from the library sciences and information sciences and uh, semantics experts to be able to work together on these problems um, in that uh, we simply uh, are a long way from reconciling these challenges, uh, particularly around um, building knowledge graphs that have to account for uh, the use of metadata standards that are designed for very different scales of analysis and how to reconcile these things. Um, one of these points here was that the ontologies uh, very often uh, focus on different granularities uh, and we need to be able to build out relationships across these things uh, to be able to link these objects together. With respect to FAIR and open across the data life cycle, there's very little work that's happening there or at least uh, planning or scoping of work that lets us think about this across the whole life cycle of the data. Um, we talk about FAIR at the front end, we talk about and what researchers need to do, we talk about FAIR in terms of repositories, and that's fantastic. Um, we have lots of conversations about interoperability, um, probably not enough about reuse, we need a lot more research there. Um, but we haven't figured out the ways that we need to move the data, um, uh, capture the scholarly record, m and move materials, data, objects, software, across uh, the infrastructure that supports um, the, the stewardship life cycle. And so um, we need processes for moving data from active use storage, for example, uh, potentially to community manage kinds of uh, places, uh, and, then, and then potentially over to archival and preservation services. Um, we don't have good uh, disposal and data uh, decision making around those processes, and we don't have well-established on-ramps and off-ramps. We don't have the kinds of handshakes or negotiations and arrangements amongst the infrastructure to be able to move these, these data um, uh, along the way. Now, we're starting to get some tooling in this space. PressQT, for example, is a, a project that was funded, uh, I think, by IMLS and maybe also some by NSF. And it's an example of a set of tools that support the transfer of research assets from uh, some repositories over to others. Uh, it's, it's a nice little suite of tools. Uh, it does a lot of integrity checks. It even is built in or uh, spins out to some fair assessment. Uh, but there are significant limits with respect to the size uh, of, of uh, what the data files uh, and projects they can move. Um, given that we're, uh, you know, team science is just exploding, mid-scale and large-scale science uh, is really growing. Um, and we need to be able to have those sorts of tools uh, and those arrangements and agreements uh, uh, to be able to move that for very large data sets. So international models, I'm not gonna spend much time here. I'll leave this slide, um, I'll be posting these, and of course I'm happy to answer questions later. Um, but these uh, informed us in some potential ways we can think about organizing and bringing uh, some new opportunities for collaboration. Just as a quick example, the FAIR cookbook, which was developed in the EU, uh, was a, a, a really big hit uh, at the meeting, and there's opportunities to collaborate with people that developed that cookbook, which is really a how-to manual for planning and implementation. Um, and 
It's, uh, it, there's room to grow, and they're looking for U.S. collaborators to help build that out. With respect to the domain initiatives, um, we had there represented, uh, you can see people from digital agriculture, uh, all the way through, we had somebody from the National uh, Magnetics Laboratory, which is funded by NSF. It's a, a set of three laboratories, dark energy uh, and dark matter uh, researchers, eco and environmental. So we covered really a wide range uh, of science uh, disciplines or domains uh, with very different kinds of data problems. Um, in terms of models of engagement and, and some of the things they pointed out that Really, the bottom-up efforts that we're all familiar with uh, that happen at the community level that re can really engage and uh, the, the research data management and libraries tend to drive some of these things, as do some, some of the professional societies. The bottom-up efforts can really be responsive to research needs. But those and the community level work cannot accomplish everything. We really need to think about also some top down, very large scale uh, consensus building um, and amplification of activities. So you can imagine, for example, um, international global neuroscience organizations starting to adapt the language of FAIR and really helping amplify the standards, the data standards that are available to neuroscience researchers to be able to push. Uh, those practices out and make data much more uh, easily, not only findable, but reusable. Um, some of the things where we need to think about still, and this won't be a surprise to those of you that know my work, um, there, there will always be disciplinary difference for which we need individualized or localized solutions. Um, for some disciplines, for example, the data are collected for very specific purposes. There'll be a community of practice for whom those data are going to be readily reusable. But the work and cost of translating uh, the, the representation of those data out for farther and farther uh, uh, dislocated uh, communities or distinct communities away from the original community of practice is very difficult um, and, and may, not be, may not be cost effective. So I think we need to be thinking about how we uh, organize and apply uh, the work around FAIR uh, really in ways that are going to make sense uh, for the best data reuse uh, we can provide. Also, there's still a lot of proprietary work uh, or, or instrument-specific code uh, and formats. So this came up in the dark matter and dark energy group, that in fact there are many instruments and people still write their own code. This makes uh, data for reanalysis or reanalysis of data or combination of data uh, very, very difficult. This is a, a place where uh, the community is really coming together to develop new software to help solve some of these problems. And finally, in machine learning and AI-based uh, research, uh, fundamental problems with finding the code, train models, and training data. Okay, so this is just a quick example of some of our process. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on the slide. I just want to give you a quick snapshot of sort of what this looked like as we were working along the way. Spent a lot of time sort of... Um, uh, there was no meaning to the color coding here. People just used different colored uh, sticky notes. Uh, but we started to look for ways that people were, uh, you know, uh, tallying up um, items that were uh, uh, important um, and getting votes. So we did that in a couple of ways, and this was one of them. So a few more takeaways from the discussion session. So here is an example of a, a question that we started out with. Um, and in fact, this was the, the first uh, question um, uh, from the domain space. And, and we wanted to understand sort of, well, where can we start? You know, what can we do that could have the broadest impact with the least amount of resources required now? And interestingly, the response was there is no more low-hanging fruit. So really, we're in a place now where we have to bring together multiple communities with different kinds of expertise to address the problems, to move toward FAIR. Uh, so that we're, we're really in a, a place now where this is highly complex. So um, we also identified, one of the groups in particular identified and categorized a set of barriers. I won't read these barriers. This, so individually, again, these won't be uh, of surprise to many of you, but being, being able to start to take these things and organize a roadmap, if you will, uh, for how we move forward and set 
some aims over the next five years to really help the community move forward and inform the community as they're developing proposals and starting to put together the research coordination networks. Uh, our scoping report will uh, hopefully be very helpful for all of that. Um, and I'd say we have a need for a kind of a decadal plan. Um, in fact, I, uh, our report will include that. Um, we need some sort of a plan that helps us think about particularly addressing some of the uh, disjointedness of the policies um, and approaches across some of the funding agencies. We need to start to think about how uh, our plans and responses to that can, can address some of those things. Okay, so I'm at 21 minutes. I'm gonna stop and take some Q&A. Um, there's some good examples here uh, that, uh, again, my slides will be available. Um, I think the last points I want to make here are just some reminders that FAIR doesn't address quality. You know, that will live with the disciplines and domains uh, and the scholarly communication system. Um, security uh, is becoming increasingly important. And should we be thinking about adding this into data management plans or at least uh, planning? It's not related to FAIR, but I think we need to bring security into the conversation. Um, and we've been figuring out uh, a long time about what goes where and for how long. Uh, and we need to still uh, spend a lot of time working on that, uh, particularly in the context of reuse. Okay, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much. Here's the team. I uh, appreciate all of their help and the scoping report will be forthcoming. And thank you. Hi. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what you just met on the last slide about security being present in the DMP? And are you saying that you're not seeing people address it in the backup section of DMPs? Or are you talking about like some other aspect of security? Yes, I'm talking about some other aspect. So um, security and cybersecurity are now fundamental to the ways that we have to think about organizing um, where data goes, how it's represented, uh, access controls. And for a lot of scientists, and um, as we heard in the talk yesterday, there was a just wonderful panel on, on security and privacy, um, we're at a place where I think we need to think about how to integrate overall security of the data content. Um, there's a lot of research that is that where security has, it doesn't matter at all. But there's a tremendous amount of um, work happening, uh, particularly, you know, it may not even fall under our IRB controlled or regulated uh, uh, data, but data that's sensitive, uh, it may be that we have programmatic um, work happening. We produce a lot of data. We're not necessarily thinking about how we manage all of that. So it may not fall under a DMP. It may be part of some other data management realm uh, within the university. But I think we need to start thinking about how it fits into these planning processes, whether it's the DMP, whether it's some other uh, cybersecurity or, uh, sorry, cyber infrastructure collaboration plan that happens. Um, and I know it's a little, it's sort of orthogonal to what we were talking about with FAIR, but um, uh, it's, time for, it's time for us to start to think about how to integrate all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a really um, helpful overview of this. Um, I have a sort of a trivial question and then a real question. The trivial question is I'm really looking forward to reading this report. Um, do you have any sense of the time frame when it's going to be yes. likely available? Yes. Um, we have a full draft uh, aim for first week of May for the full draft. We're going to get some comment on our first full draft. And then uh, I hope it's out by June 1st, if Wonderful. not before. Okay. Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll be sure to try and share that out to the CNI announcement list when it's ready. Um, my real question, 
at least in some of the discussions I've heard in mostly European circles about FAIR and how, how to implement it, they, there, there's been a fairly rapid recognition that it has to be dealt with on a disciplinary or even really almost subdisciplinary um, uh, basis um, where it, it's kind of easy to come up with standards for certain series of data sets that are widely shared or reused, but um, the more general you make it, the harder it gets. And I'm wondering how much of that you heard in this workshop um, uh, about um, generality versus very, you know, small data sharing communities. Yes, we did. So uh, particularly in the, the domain session. Um, so in just a, a really quick example, so that's, that's a great question, Cliff, and, and a quick example um, is that around findability, we want to move towards standards of data citation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but for some communities, the practice of writing out a, a typical sort of reference that goes in the reference list is simply not the way that community produces their work or that the scientists use those references within their reuse of the publications. And therefore, just for example, in the neurosciences, data citations are generally found within the body of the paper. So we need to do two things. Yes, we want data citation, but we need to think about the format of the data citation that fits differently in different parts of the paper, and then we need the tooling to be able to discover those uh, those citations or references within the body of the paper if it's not in the reference list. So, so that, you know, that's a very specific example with respect to the scholarly communication space and findability and, uh, and data citation. Um, with respect to data itself, uh, these, these places are, uh, the examples I gave, I think there were two in there um, that I can expound on. One is, in the environmental science, uh, 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 earth sciences data where they do field research, they're collecting very specific kinds of, of granular level data for specific questions. It's very difficult uh, to think about standards for representing those data beyond uh, the Im immediate you know, use that, that it was designed for. Um, that's very difficult to do. And, uh, and in the machine learning space, and this is where I think as we move to, toward new uh, digital platforms, so the uh, Elmer, Emerald Lab uh, example we heard from yesterday was fantastic because there's, they are producing a tremendous amount of very standardized data, but in, then there's a set of processes that have to happen as those data move from the instruments out to other platforms and then beyond. Um, Again, those kinds of things will be specific to the data generated by the specific group or for the specific instrument, just as an example. So, yes, thank you. Okay, well, I know it's lunchtime, so appreciate you all being here. It's good to see you. Thank you very much.